In this video of my journey through Krakow, you're gonna find this guy blowing trumpet on the roof of a church. This bone dangling in front of the entryway to a cathedral. And a dragon breathing fire once every 4 minutes. So let's hit that like button, swallow all of those pierogies, and let it begin. And there is no better way to begin the tour of this historical Krakow other than the Barbican situated at the northern edge of the old town. This is one of the only three surviving Gothic bastions in the entire Europe. It was constructed fearing an invasion by the Ottomans from the south, but it served much more important roles in later sieges against the Austrians and the Russians. It was intentionally built to be off-center from the axis of the main square, in order to give the guards more time to visually evaluate the potential dangers. While the bastion sits outside the old city walls, the gate of St. Florian marks the entrance to the proper old medieval town. It seems to be extremely impressive, but if you think about just two centuries ago, this gate is just one of the nearly 30 plus towers that have been erected along the city walls. Inside the gate, you can see an altar with a late baroque copy of a classicist painting of the Black Madonna. And on the other side, facing the inner city, you can see it features a bas relief depicting Saint Florian. And this segment of the old city wall is the only one that are remaining, so if you want to take a closer look of the old historical town, your best source of information might just be this tiny bronze replica of the city in the late 18th century. But don't worry, even though the walls have come down, the streets have remained its original flavor. Let's go check them out. Since the old town was built by German immigrants, it was laid out in an orderly grid-like fashion, and the later addition of Art Nouveau onto a lot of the street corners marked an exemplary transition from an old medieval town into the 17th and 18th century style. While the cobbled streets in the center are narrow, they housed a lot of really important buildings, such as this university. It had an underground section that is now the student canteen, but it features quite a lot of history on the walls. And just to give you an example, Pope John Paul II once studied theology here. He was here for a full year before the Nazi invasion kicked him out and forced him into manual labor for the rest of the war. And it was likely during those years he started developing thoughts of becoming a priest full time. And now we all know him as one of the best popes we have had in the recent centuries. He was one of the very few people who managed to escape the communist Poland and were able to come back to spread the message from outside the Iron Curtain. And he would stand next to this window in his old bedroom and encourage the Polish people to resist the communist occupation. So in some ways, Pope John Paul II not only saved the Catholic faith from collapsing, but also likely aided in the end of the communist regime. On the southeastern side of the central square, the church of St. Wojciech stands tall as an 11th century church tower overlooking the entire old town. And in front of the statue of Adam Mickiewicz, you can see the Cloth Hall, which used to be the center of all trade here in Krakow. But nowadays, it paddles all kinds of souvenirs to satisfy every tourist flocking to the place. However, what interests me the most is St. Mary's Basilica sitting on the other side of the square. After the bell tower rings after every full hour, a well-dressed gentleman comes out near the top floor of the church tower and blows a nice tune on his trumpet. Wait, did you catch that? The note of the trumpets ended so abruptly that you might think I intentionally edited it out. No, but it is exactly how it's supposed to play out. 
This is likely because back in the day, the trumpet's purpose was to signal the opening and closing of the gates on the four sides. So the trumpeter is supposed to play half of the song once at every cardinal direction. And there will be another trumpeter who is supposed to complete the song when the gate is completely opened or closed. But of course, it had to develop into an urban legend when an American tourist came here in the 1930s. So the fictional story goes like this. In 1241, when the invading Mongols marched towards the front of the Krakow gates, they were supposed to launch a surprise attack. But the trumpeters saw the hiding Tartars and decided to blow the trumpet as a signal to close the gates. Thanks to his bravery, the city of Krakow was saved. But a very annoyed Mongolian archer decided to shoot an arrow and it went straight through the trumpeter's throat. And thus, the song was never finished. And to finish out my morning, I visited the Julius Słowacki Theater. It is named after this famous Polish poet and is now a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site. Originally built as a 19th century eclectic theater opera house, this place has become the go-to place for all of the upper class here in Krakow for any important ceremonies. So at that day, I was not allowed entry since I was just a poor backpacker. But I do have something else in mind. And guess what I found in this tiny little street? Exactly what we are looking for. Look, a milk bar. <laughs> yeah, in a tiny, tiny street. You know, serving all the people who still remember in Soviet days. <sighs> this entire thing is less than four dollars. Holy shoot. Tons of pierogies and an entire cutlet. Yeah, I'm ready to eat. I'm so hungry. 298 frozen patties later. I'm in the heart of the old Jewish quarter, Casimir's, but it is only Jewish in name only because sadly, during the occupation of the German Nazis, 25% of the city's population, which are Jewish, were expelled or captured and eventually sent to death camps all around Poland and Eastern Europe. This area was historically owned by a Jewish uh, family. If you are familiar with uh, Steven Spielberg uh, famous movie Schindler's List, you're gonna notice a very, very famous scene that took place here in this very alley. But sadly, uh, this entire city of Krakow these days have no Jewish people left.
and let's explore the most important site in the entire city. The Vavil Castle was built by King Casimir III the Great, one of the best leaders the Polish nation has ever seen. It sits at a limestone outcrop right next to the Vistula River, and oversees the entire Old Town as well as the floodplains to the south. It was the place where every single Polish king was crowned, as well as the place where they were buried. And the heart of Polish religion sphere, the Vavil Cathedral, also sits within the compound. It includes nearly every single European architecture style, ranging from medieval to renaissance to baroque. And there is no better fit of the title of the very first UNESCO World Heritage Site than this place. However, before I bring you into the cathedral, let me show you a very interesting item hanging near the doorway. To those of you who know, this one up here is obviously a whalebone. And I got to know it closely based on my adventures in Falkland Islands where they made a church and then made an arch out of these bones. But to those medieval peasants who dug this up in the, in the river down there, it might as well be a dragon. And yeah, that's how the legends are born. The Krakow Dragon. And once you go inside this cathedral, you will soon realize why a lot of people refer to Krakow as the true Polish capital. It is where all of the history pile on top of each other layer upon layer, sometimes physically here in the cathedral. Every single nave was so intricately decorated that it was impossible to simply glance it over during a short walk, but it forces you to stop and take a closer speculation. The dome of each of them is either very well painted or carefully sculpted, bearing kings and queens from every single bygone era that makes you shudder at the thought of the history of this nation. So it is not hard for anyone who has ever been to Poland, and especially Krakow, to imagine the power of the nation back in the days. Down on the ground, you can see where the poet Adam Mischkiewicz took his final resting place. Right next to his lifetime frenemy, Swalwatsky. Meanwhile, if you climb the dark and cramped bell tower all the way to the top of the cathedral, you are awarded with a view of one of the most powerful bells in the entire country, capable of generating sound waves that can be heard nearly 30 kilometers away. And if I am standing right here, if it begins ringing, my brain will literally shatter into a pile of goo. But it will be all worth it given the fact that the view from this platform is absolutely gorgeous, as this tower dominates the entire skyline and can be seen from any part of the city. Next to the cathedral is the castle proper, where the king used to reside. It was built in a very peculiar southern Italian style, as the king who modeled it really wanted to impress his Italian wife. But it created endless problems for the servants who are trying to deliver food in the endless snowstorms that are common in the nation during the winter. On top of the bastion, it offers an incredible view over the Vistula River. And guess what? Even a tiny cave underneath the walls has a surprising story to tell. And funnily, every single legend that involves the origin of the city name, Krakow, actually involves this very dragon. You see, um, the legend goes by, um, there's uh, this dragon that lived underneath the entire castle complex back in the day. And you can see right down here. And he was devouring everyone. Sheep, goats, and the humans all alike, and demands tribute, you know? If you don't give him enough goats every week, he will come down, eat people, who are not basically contributing to the entire tribute every week. One day, some random shoemaker called Crack came up with the idea. She said, hey, maybe we can try to, you know, try to defeat this dragon instead of using, you know, our knives and then, you know, swords and shields. We can use our brain, our wits, right? So instead, he came up with the idea of filling a sheep full of sulfur and then feed it to the dragon. So they put it right here in front of the cave and then the dragon woke up and said, hey, my God, free breakfast time to eat it up but of course it's full of sulfur so he got he got very thirsty and he went right down there to the river and then started drinking water he drank so much water that he exploded so oh yeah by the way it burns every four minutes yeah even though it only has seven heads only one breathes fire every four minutes and um, Oh, it's just one of the remain reminders that the dragon still lives on right here in the city.
what a historical and beautiful place Krakow is. And in the sister episode of this vlog, you're gonna find me taking a small day trip into Velichka, where I will get trapped 500 feet underground in a salt mine. So click the like button down beneath and don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you in Velichka.